All right, let's go and get started. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get the, the sign-in sheet passed around. All right, so uh, I, I've got uh, a couple of announcements for you. So you've got that homework design or the design attention members homework that's due on Monday. I have homework two, but that's uh, actually homework three. Um, has anybody, has everybody started homework three or at least given it a, a, a once over? I, I will say this, that's the one homework you probably don't want to put off until the last minute. If you take it a little bit at a time, it'll be all right. But if it's Sunday at 11 p.m. and you go, oh, there's that steel homework due tomorrow morning, it's going to be a late night. So I would just take that sort of one step at a time. Um, I've got uh, homework two graded. I'm, I've been sort of here and there passing that out. Uh, let's see, anybody not get theirs? Okay, all right, let's see. Mr. Fadiga. Let's see. Miss, Miss Clark. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, so Miss Davis, now I got yours. Let's see. Did I get you yours? Yes. Okay. Let's see, am I missing? Mr. McCracken, there we go. That's what I'm missing. All right, um, let me go ahead and get a solution passed out for this. Uh, I, I got to be honest, there's really not a lot of, uh, not a lot really to say about homework too because you all did pretty well. Um, the only thing that I guess is worth mentioning is that just making sure you're checking all your uh, failure paths for net area, make sure you're um, checking all your cases for shear lag uh, and whatnot. But by and large, everything was, uh, was pretty straightforward. So uh, I'll just walk through the solution real quick. So, so here's problem one. Uh, I think the problem was, uh, was pretty easy. And, and as you went through and started checking net paths, you probably found that there was a pattern. More holes ended up yielding less, uh, less net area. So the one that governed was that really long one. What was it like C, D, E, F, H, I, L. So that's the one that ended up governing. Got a net area of about, I think it was like 5.9, 5.93, okay. The angle and the channel, for the angle, you had to make sure you were checking case two and case eight associated with shear lag. For the channel, it was just case two because it, there, it wasn't an eye shape and it wasn't an angle, so you didn't need to worry about uh, 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 any other cases of shear lag. But you had a number of cases with stagger. So for instance, uh, looking at the channel, so here's the channel. Remember, you, you know, you, you've got to check all of the associated paths along the lead line. So for this, you've really got three potential paths. You know, you've got path one that sort of just directly cuts like that. You've got path two that can sort of do this. Remember, you've got, it can be symmetric. You can flip it up and up and down. That's fine. And then path three will sort of go like that, go down and then go down like that. So you've got three potential failure paths. The third one was the one that ended up governing, but you've got to make sure you're, you're checking all of them. Uh, but other than that, I don't really think there's really a, a whole lot to say. I think you all did uh, very well. Um, if you came in a little late, no big deal. I'll just uh, get you. I've got a pack of them up here. I'll just uh, pass them out near the end. So I'm going to go ahead and pass these out. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whoop. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm just gonna start that over there, Mr. Lewis. All right. Does anybody have any questions about this or about homework three? I mean, I, I have. I've already had a couple questions about it. Does anybody got any others? All right. Okay, so a couple other announcements. Um, so let's see. So I, I wanted to mention the steel bridge because the steel arrived in the uh, uh, engineering labs uh, over here. Uh, it was Monday. So um, they're going to be working on this real soon. They're going to do a lot of cutting, a lot of grinding, a lot of drilling, a lot of welding. So if you're interested in getting involved with that and getting your hands dirty, I'd contact Austin Page. He's the uh, steel bridge captain this year. His email is page44 uh, at marshall.edu. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you're interested in steel and interested in, in getting your hands dirty, this is definitely a worthwhile endeavor. Um, also, again, I'm 
I'm gonna always, I'm gonna sort of keep this up here. Remember, we got our first celebration of learning next Friday, uh, and we're gonna start a little early again, just to make sure everybody's got time. So Friday, the 17th, we'll have our first exam. Everybody good? All right. Okay, so today um, we're sort of going to get into a brand new topic. I mean, we've spent the last oh, six or seven lectures talking about tension members. So literally taking a piece of steel, yanking on it, and, and asking ourselves the different ways that it can fail, and ultimately trying to design one, you know, selecting a, uh, uh, a tension member to resist, you know, certain loads, certain dead loads, live loads, uh, et cetera. But, up until now, we've really sort of put the blinders on in regards to the bolts, to the connection. I mean, we've just, you know, we've been, uh, we've been given a design scenario, and here's the connection. Just go to work. Well, now I want to take some time and talk about the connection. You know, uh, considering what we talked about last time when we discussed the, the Hyatt Regency collapse, I mean, you know, that, that was a really big deal. You know, a lot of people lost their lives, but one of the details that might have been glossed over a little bit was, it wasn't the main member that failed at all. It was the connection. Okay, connections, just by their 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 uh, their behavior and by their patterns, they can be kind of difficult to design and design uh, correctly. So, I want to go through some of the fundamental basics associated with connections, the different ways uh, that they can fail, the uh, associated limit states, uh, layout requirements, and uh, and things like that. And we'll we'll have a few examples and ultimately. Uh, get into uh, get into some design okay so let's sort of get into this let's uh, I'm gonna start off and let's just talk a little bit about uh, bolts in general you know, um, bolts are a little unlike um, uh, uh, some of the, the steel grades that we use in terms of availability I mean there are some you know unique little differences here and there between bolt grades but by and large there's really only two grades or two types of bolts that we're going to use uh, for most uh, civil engineering structures. We're either going to use A325 bolts or A490 bolts. And if you just have a structural bolt and you look on the head, you'll be able to tell what it is. So for instance, you know, I've got A490, you can tell what the grade is. The first symbol will tell you the grade. The symbol down here, this LE, that's a reference to the manufacturer. So that particular bolt uh, was manufactured by Lejeune. That's their manufacturer symbol and we have you know new core Yamato and, and all, all sorts of other uh, bolt manufacturers and uh, that's how they indicate that uh, difference between a325 and a490 is a490s are a little more expensive but they're a little stronger so it's a trade-off and it just depends on the prices uh, when you're working on your project I mean is it cheaper to use let's say 10 a325 bolts or 490s well it just depends on the price and you know as well as I do that steel prices tend to go up and down, so it's one of those things just sort of depends on what day of the week it is. Now, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention A307 bolts. They're, uh, they're listed in the spec, but they're really not very common. They're mostly used for uh, a temporary erection, you know, if you're lifting a member, maybe just take an A307 and hold it in place so you can let the crane off and then go through and uh, fasten your connection with either A325s or, uh, or A490s. So they're there, but they're really not uh, used very common. Sound good? All right. <laughs> now later on, we're going to talk about uh, the different types of installation methods that you can use for installing bolts. And it leads into um, two different classes of bolted connections that we'll design. We either design uh, bearing type connections or slip critical connections. And the difference is that when we uh, use slip critical connections, we're actually counting on that friction that you develop uh, between the two plates. And that's really important in two big scenarios. Number one, when you're looking at a bridge, because you always use slip critical connections for bridges. And two, during earthquake design, because you always want slip critical connections uh, for earthquakes. And, and they tend to uh, uh, have a lot of demand on them. Because of the, the nature of, uh, of slip critical connections, there's a lot of proprietary items out there. A lot of folks are selling, you know, special wrenches and special type of bolts that are, um, that'll uh, help you install slip critical connections uh, safely. Like, hey, you'll save a lot of time, but by the way, buy our wrench that costs X number of thousands of dollars so you can, uh, so you can install these. Because of that development, because of the, uh, you know, the different, you know, little intricacies here and there with different bolts, 
there's a number of different ASTM grades that all kind of mean the same thing. They kind of either reference to A325 or A490, but they actually have different names. So the way that the steel manual resolved that is they just said, all right, let's just keep it simple. We've either got group A bolts or we've got group B bolts, okay? So group A bolts would really reference all these that all have the same material properties and whatnot, but they just fit a different spec because they're manufactured a little bit differently and they're installed uh, a little bit differently. So I, I guess the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning all of this is that when you open up the manual, it's going to list group A and group B. But you know, if you're in the uh, fabrication plant and you start asking uh, everybody where's the group A bolt stored, they're going to look at you a little weird because there's no such thing as group A bolts. They're either A325 or A49. Does that make sense? Are you okay with that? Okay. <coughs> Now, um, I'm not going to uh, you know, make you, you know, verbatim draw this out on an exam and, and list all the different you know, terminology, you know, what's the grip, what's the shank, uh, and all that. Uh, but I do want you to have at least just a general idea uh, of what a bolt looks like. The really, I guess, most important parameter I want you to understand is that for a typical structural bolt, the threads, they don't go all the way from end to end. Okay. So, you know, we talked about this last time, but more often than not, when I have a structural bolt, I'm taking that bolt and I'm loading it in shear. You know, I'm taking it and I'm, I'm shearing it like this. So, one of the big questions you've got to ask is, are you shearing through the threads or are you shearing through the shank? And that matters because where do you think, the, where do you think that the bolt is strongest, through the shank or through the threads? Through the shank. So where the shear plane is, where you're actually shearing through, that matters, okay? And we're going to see some notation here in a little bit that will kind of uh, uh, expand on that for us, but I, I just wanted you to kind of get that general idea. Now, let me ask you this. If you're looking at detailing a connection, you're doing some calcs, and you don't know. You don't know whether or not the, the threads are included in the plane or excluded. Are you going to assume it's through the shank or through the threads? Through the threads, a absolutely. So when in doubt, always assume that your shear plane is going through the threads. Sound good? All right. <coughs> now, um, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I at least want to make sure that everybody kind of understands what happens when you take plate A and plate B and connect them together with a given bolt. Okay? And by and large, what's going to happen is you're going to develop three different potential forces, okay? Number one is shearing through the bolt. You know, you're taking a bolt, you know, it's connecting two plates and you're loading it. You're going to be shearing that bolt. You're going to develop a shear stress uh, within that bolt. So one of the things that we're going to try and prevent when we start doing a lot of our design is let's make sure we don't shear the bolts in half. Simple, right? That's force number one. Force number two is what we call bolt bearing. So the idea is you've got this bolt going through a plate, the bolt literally might come into contact with the plate and start loading or bearing onto that plate. So the plate itself might experience failure. It might want to tear out or you might want to take that bolt hole and stretch it out uh, a little bit. That's going to be uh, a limit that we try and uh, prevent. The third one, and this is the one that, that goes into uh, slip critical connections, is, is friction. You know, let's go back to basic physics, right? You take a, a normal plane, smack a force on it, you develop a frictional force between those two, uh, those two planes, right? Remember that? You got your normal force multiplied by your coefficient of static friction. Remember that? Well, think about what happens when you tighten a bolt together. You got plate A, plate B, you stick a bolt through them and you start tightening. What's happening to the two plates? They come together, right? You start cranking on that bolt quite a bit, you're, those plates are really going to get sandwiched together. There's your normal force. You got steel connected with steel, there's a coefficient of static friction. You can get some frictional force developed between those two plates. You can actually rely on that for design purposes, which we do in cases like bridges or cases like earthquakes. And we'll talk about the different ways that you install that and the different ways that you can uh, uh, you know, develop that friction uh, later on. So far so good? Okay. <coughs> so these are the different forces that you'll get uh, for a given bolted connection. This can result in a number of different failure modes. Now, so I've got here just something simple. I've got a single bolted joint. I've got a plate lapped onto another plate and just a single bolt through it. 
Now, right now what I've got is I'm discussing the different ways that that particular connection can fail. Now, some of these you've already seen, right? I mean, like the one in the middle, fracture in the net section, we've already done that, right? Just a you know, samurai sword or a lightsaber through the plate, net area, shear lag factor of one. Everybody's, everybody knows that. Also, gross section yielding, right? Just remember hitting FY in the main body of the member. That's a failure mechanism as well. This is the stuff that we did before when associated with, uh, with tension members. Same story here, right? But what I want to focus on is the stuff associated with the bolted connection. So one of them, shear failure in the bolt, literally taking the bolt, shearing it in half. That's something we're going to want to prevent. Okay. <clears throat> Another one is, is sort of represented by these two right here. This is what's called a bolt hole ovalization. So the idea is you know, here's my plate, here's my bolt hole, I've got a bolt going into it, and I'm loading it in shear. So that bolt is coming into contact with that plate and it's bearing on it quite a bit. That might have the tendency to want to take that bolt hole and just stretch it out, right? Make it longer, elongate it. Well, we really, really don't want that to happen either because that could potentially lead to tear out. You know, actually that little bit of plate right there, just ripping it out. It's almost like a, uh, like a, like a mini block shear, right? Just taking that little sliver of plate and just ripping it out. Imagine that happen across the, uh, the entire connection. That's obviously something we wouldn't want to have happen. Make sense? Now, there's a couple other mechanisms, things like, uh, like tension failure of the bolt. That would be if we're taking a bolt and loading it in tension instead of shear. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, also, we could have something like, like bending failure. Um, but by and large, bending failure really isn't going to govern. We're really going to be more concerned uh, with this. Now, I got to image of that uh, later on. Everybody okay with this so far? Any questions? All right. <clears throat> All right, so I, I mentioned this before, but we're really going to focus on two different types of connections. I'm going to spend most of my time uh, today and probably going into next time discussing bearing type connections. So this is when I'm not really counting on that friction that's being developed uh, between the two plates. I've literally just got bolt shear and, and bolt bearing to worry about. Like I said, uh, slip critical is where we uh, count on the friction. Like I said, you can count on the friction, but by and large when you use slip critical connections, if you really need that friction for the connection, you're probably going to end up using more bolts. And uh, a good rule of thumb is if I need, I don't know, let's say I need about 10 bolts for a bearing type connection, for that same connection, if I wanted to use slip critical bolts, I'd need about 20. Um, but, I mean, when you need it, you, you need it. I mean, like I said, in, in things like bridges or things like earthquakes, you know, we really don't want those bolts loosening during a lot of that, you know, cyclic loading, so we need them to stay there. And in those instances, you know, you just kind of have to go with a slip critical connection. But now, but for right now, I'm going to focus on bolt bearing and then we'll take care of slip critical later. Right. Sound good? Yes, sir. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, to, to elaborate that on that a little bit, um, when you have a, a bearing type connection, essentially all you're worried about is getting the bolts just sort of snug tight. And snug tight is sort of a, a loose definition. Okay, a very loose definition. You know, what's snug tight to you versus snug tight to you or you? And it's loose because we're not worried about developing a certain amount of friction. But uh, for slip critical connection, we are. We really are trying to achieve a certain amount of friction. So this is when you're using, you know, like a, a glorified torque wrench to get a specific set of torque in that bolt and ultimately develop a predictable amount of friction. But in bearing type connections, we're not going to worry about that. Are you going to get some friction? Probably, but nothing that you can count on. I mean, installing a slip critical bolt properly, you know, getting that specific amount of tension takes time, and ultimately that's going to cost money. So you've got to be really choosy uh, in terms of when you use it. And that's why I mentioned there are specific uh, applications like earthquakes and, and bridges. Like if we were out in LA, we'd be using slip critical connections all over the place. Does that sound good? Anybody else all right with that? All right, so let's sort of get into the math a little bit. Let's sort of get into uh, to what's going on. So 
When we talk about bearing type connections, we're really associated or, or uh, trying to discuss two different failure phenomenon, either failure of the bolt or failure of the plate. So let's talk about the bolt first. Okay? Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's other ways that a bolt can fail. You know, you can have a bending failure of the bolt. You know, you're taking the bolt and you're sort of going like that. It is very possible that that bolt could experience, you know, some type of bending. Okay? Now, that is very realistic in a connection where you have uh, just one bolt. Okay? But we haven't dealt with that before in this class, and you won't deal with that very much in, uh, in practice either. I mean, look at the connections that we've been dealing with so far. They've had, what, like 12 bolts, 16 bolts, or 9 bolts, or, or something like that. Because, you know, if you've got a connection, because there's so many other bolts going on, and because there's such a sort of a constrained geometry, if you've got multiple bolts, A, this really isn't likely to happen, that's point one, and B, this is definitely the more drastic failure. I mean, if your bolt bends, yeah, it sucks, but it's still there. You know, if the bolt fractures, that's a problem, right? Again, going back to my analogy, if this bolt is holding up a bridge that your grandma drives across every day to go get groceries, grandma's in the river, okay? And we don't want that to happen, all right? Sound good? So this is going to be right here our ultimate limit that we're going to check. So let's get into some math. All right, now to compute the capacity, it's pretty simple, okay? All you take is the area of the bolt, you know, pi r squared or pi d squared over 4, and multiply that times a limiting stress, all right? So you look up that limiting stress uh, based off of your grade of your bolt and a couple other parameters that we'll discuss here in a little bit to compute your nominal capacity. Now remember, that's nominal. We have to always at the end adjust with fee. So our fee value for bolt shear is... Uh, is 0.75. And you'll tend to find that pattern across the board for just about everything that we do in this class. If we're talking about yielding, our fee value tends to be around 0.9. But if we're talking about fracture, our fee value tends to be 0.75. Uh, again, you know, if, if it yields, it, it sucks, but it's still there. If it fractures, it's, you know, it's, it's popped in half. So that's an issue. So far so good? Okay. So we've got a couple questions that we need to answer. Number one, are the threads included in the shear plane? And how many shear planes are there? Okay. So let's, let's take them one at a time. Let's start off with threads included in the shear plane. So we mentioned this uh, last or a little bit ago, but you know, threads included in the shear plane, that matters for capacity. Because again, which bolt do you think is weaker? One on the left or the one on the right? One on the left, exactly. Because if I'm shearing through threads, that's less area, right? It's less area, so there's less material to resist that load, okay? So we as engineers, we need to know that. Now, it's, it's very easy to spec a bolt that has uh, uh, threads excluded from the plane. You just have to select the bolt accordingly. Yes, sir? You're exactly, okay, to, to answer your question, yes, it would be advantageous, but sometimes it's not so simple because it's going to depend not only on the availability of the bolt, you know, let's say, you know, I, I choose a three-quarter inch diameter bolt. Well, three-quarter inch diameter bolts are available in various lengths. So I might get a two-inch long bolt, a three-inch long bolt. So that's one parameter. Another parameter is the thickness, you know, is this five-eighths inches thick? Is it three-quarters? Is this a half-inch? So can you spec it? Yeah, but not all the time. You know, you, you can't really spec it all the time. And really, in general, you kind of just need to be able to assess both. Fortunately, I'll say it's, it's easy to assess both. And, and again, going back to my original point, when in doubt, threads included or threads excluded? Included, all right? So when in doubt, if you don't know, assume threads included. When, when I'm in design mode, I always assume threads are included. And then what I would do is I'd go to the catalog and I'd say, all right, now it's time to start buying bolts. And if I find, hey, I can buy a bolt and the threads are excluded, I'll go back and change my design. I'll see if I can cut off a few bolts. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Anybody else good with that? That's a good point. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So threads included versus threads excluded, this is how we handle this in the manual. 
Okay? So first off, I want everybody to go to this table in the manual. So this should, first off, this should be familiar because we looked at this table last time. Okay? So I'm on 16.1, so I'm back here in the spec, and I'm on page 120. Okay? So let's see. It should be on the left page. It should look something about like this. Everybody find that? Okay, all right. Now, <clears throat> so this is the table that lists our nominal shear stress capacities as a function of our bolt grade. So let's look at the two group A rows. And you can read it out. You say, the first one says what? Group A bolts when the threads are not excluded from the shear plane and then group A bolts where the threads are excluded from the shear plane. Everybody see that? Now, look at your shear stresses. What's the shear stress for threads included versus threads excluded? What we got? 54 and what? All right, everybody's with me. So this is how the manual accounts for that. It just reports a different shear stress value. So if the threads are included, we have a weaker bolt and then ultimately a smaller FNV. All right? Does that make sense? So it, it's a pretty easy way to, 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 um, to realize that. And another thing that, uh, that we engineers adopt for a naming convention is we just use uh, what you see down here. So for instance, if I ever say group A in bolts, I'm talking about group A bolts where the threads are included. If I say group A X bolts, I'm saying group A bolts where the threads are excluded. Okay? So group A X bolts are the ones that are, that are stronger. So it's pretty creative, right? You like that? <laughs> All right. Everybody good so far? Yes, sir. Well, you're, I'll say this, you're sort of in a roundabout way opening up a can of worms because there's two different ways of going about this. One way to design a connection is to design for the loads. We're not designing you know, for the plate. We're saying, okay, we have a dead load of 50 kips and a live load of 80 kips. Pick the number of bolts for those loads. Now, that's one philosophy of connection design. The other is design the connection so that it doesn't fail, that the plate fails. That's that, that's a whole nother can of worms, okay? But, but let me say this. If you give me a connection and you say, well, isn't the bolt going to fail before the plate does? My answer is, I don't know. I have to go through and do the math and see. So before we said, okay, now we can, you know, we can compute gross section yielding. We can do net section fracture, block shear rupture. All that stuff is still relevant, but now we're looking at, okay, what about bolt shear? What about bolt bearing? What about all that? It's possible that the bolts govern. It's possible they don't. It, there's no simple yes or no. You just have to go through and, and, and check them all. So, is everybody, is everybody else all right with that? That this is important. Okay, all that stuff that we did before, it's still relevant. We're just for now focusing on the bolt shear and the bolt bearing. So that is important. Everybody good? Okay. Now, so. Whether or not the threads are included or, or excluded is important. Here's another thing that's also important, and that's whether or not we're dealing with a situation of single shear or a situation of double shear. Okay? Now, if we're dealing with double shear, look what's going on. This would be something like a, like a splice connection. So, for instance, if I've got member A and member B in some structure and I want to splice them together, I might have a plate behind it and a plate in front of it and a bunch of bolts going through each end. So if I look at each one of those bolts, there's not one plane that's being sheared through, there's two. Does everybody see that? Now, what ends up happening is this. This bolt down here is twice as strong as this one right here. Now, I'm not saying that the bolt magically got twice as strong. I'm not, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that I've got to shear through more bolt to fail this one than that one. I've got two areas that I've got to shear through. So again, it's not like the bolt got stronger, it's just there's more material to get through to snap that bolt, not in half, I guess, snap it in three pieces. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, 
you start thinking about this, well, we've got threads included, threads excluded, we've got single shear and double shear. I start thinking, well, I like Microsoft Excel, maybe I can write a little spreadsheet that does all this math for me. Well, the folks who wrote the manual thought the same thing. So I want you all to turn to a section here in the middle. This is one of our first design aids. So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, playing around with this. So to find it, okay, remember those black and gold tabs right here? If you look, there's literally a tab that says bolts, okay? So that is part seven of the manual. In part seven, I want you to turn to page 22, okay? And you should see this on the left, table 7-1, available shear strength of bolts. Everybody find that? Okay. All right. First off, my little star, my little outline. Remember, that's a, this is going to be a, a guide that we use quite a bit, so you're probably going to want to put a tab there. Or I see some folks already breaking out the sticky notes. That's a good one to, to tab. Okay? So that's point one. All right. Point two, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to uh, elaborate on this. For us, we're going to use the blue numbers, not the green numbers, or the ones that, that aren't shaded. Because for us, we're not using allowable strength design, we're using LRFD. So any time that you open one of these guides and there's green numbers and blue numbers, we're going off the blue ones. Okay? Sound good? All right. <coughs> Bless you. Now you start going through this guide, I think you're going to find it's really simple. Okay, this is really simple. Let's just sort of play around with it a little bit. I'm going to come up with a quick example. So, let's see. Let's say we've got whoop, group A, we'll say X bolts. We'll say the diameter of the bolt is, I don't know, 7 eighths of an inch. And we'll say it's in double shear. Let's see how strong that particular bolt is. Well, let's see. I'm on ASTM designation. I've got group A and group B, so I'm looking at group A. We've got threads excluded, so I'm on this little row down here, right? And we're in what? Single shear or double shear? We're in double shear. Everybody see that? So group A excluded, double shear, we're looking at what? This row, yeah, exactly. You got to have me. That row right there, we're looking at 7 8 inch diameter bolts, so right there, 61.3. Simple, right? So instead of doing pi d squared over 4, looking up the FNV and multiplying by phi, it's right there. So that is a, a very nifty guide that you're going to want to tab if you haven't already done so. Like I said, I saw a couple people breaking out the, the tabs already, so you're prepared. I like that. All right. Everybody okay with this? Yes, sir. It's, exactly, that, that's a good question. And the answer is it's possible. Um, I was doing some research on a bridge in Jackson County, West Virginia. It was near Ripley. And uh, we were looking at this particular connection where there were these two through trusses. And then there were floor beams framing into the through trusses. So you had, you know, gusset plates and members, but then you also had a floor beam with an end connection plate. So if you looked at those bolts, yeah, they were in triple shear. Okay. Now to go to your multiply by two, I mean, look at look at each row. Like look here, we got 17.9 and 35.8. The in, the difference is they just multiplied by two. So if you had triple shear, just take that and multiply it by three. It's possible. I'll go ahead and it's. It's not very common, but but it happens. So that's a that's a good question. That's a good. All right. So each one of these values that you're looking up are kips. Okay. So this well, we got 61.3. That would be 61.3 kips per bolt. Okay. So what I would then do is I'd say, well, how many bolts are in the connection? If there's six bolts, take that number, multiply it by six, and there's the bolt shear capacity for that connection. Now. All that will tell you is how much load it will take to fail the bolts. Okay. The next thing we got to answer is how much load it will take to fail the plate. Okay. Because those bolts are coming into contact with that plate, and that still matters too. All right. Make sense? Okay. All right. <laughs> Very good. All right. Now, now let's talk a little bit about the plate. Okay. So I've got here a connection that was loaded in shear, and and uh, they took the bolts out, and they sort of 
took a picture of it to give you kind of an idea of, uh, of what's going on. And ultimately what can happen is one of two particular phenomena. Uh, so the, the one on the bottom is the one I was mentioning earlier when the bolt hole kind of wanna, wants to stretch out a little bit, wants to ovalize, if you will. So, you know, they take this, this, uh, this plate, they loaded it in shear, so, you know, here were the bolts, and they took the plate and they yanked it up, so the bolts suddenly came into contact with the plate, right? Now, like I said, one of two things can happen. See right here, it's sort of, the bolt kind of mashed into the plate, and the plate almost turned into like a, like a little bit of Play-Doh right there, and it sort of, you know, experienced that permanent yielding. This, this phenomenon right here, we call that ovalization, just sort of mashes in and stretches out the hole a little bit. Now that's, that's one particular way that the, uh, that the uh, plate can fail. Another is tear out. It's, it's a little hard to see, but maybe I'm going to color it in a little bit. But on this one up, uh, up top, you can kind of see it like right there and about like right there. Does everybody see that? What's happening is the plate is actually starting to fracture along those paths. Now, let me ask you a question. What type of force do you think those paths are seeing? The tension, shear, there you go. Now, here's another question. Remember when we talked about block shear rupture and we got into von Mises? Remember I said there's this number that's going to pop up, this particular number. Anybody remember what that number is? When we did the block shear path, all the numbers that were associated with shear had a particular multiplier, or point something. Not, not point 0.75, a little lower. Point six, there, point, point six. Let me go back to, you're like, up, down. <laughs> now, hold on, hold on. I, I, I want to go back to that real quick. So, remember this? Remember this right here? The point six associated with that? Worked out pretty well. Y'all remember that? Remember, anything that's associated with shear in the manual is going to have that 0.6 built in there somewhere. The bolts have the 0.6 built in as well, but there's a lot of background additional uh, manufacturing parameters that go into the background. That's why they just say ah, 54 for threads included and 68 for threads excluded. But it's in there. It's in, it's in the background. All right. Uh, where was I? All right. Everybody okay with this so far? Okay. All right. Now. Let's talk about the math. So to determine the capacity of a bolt and bearing, we have the following expression. Now, it's a little weird the way it's written because you've got Rn equals a pile of junk such that it's less than or equal to another pile of junk. Remember that? Any time that the manual expresses that, it's just the manual's way of saying it's the minimum of those two values. So I'll take this equation and, and reformat it a little bit to result in uh, a little less number crunching on the calculator because I'm lazy and if I can uh, calculate the capacity and less uh, button crunches on the calculator, I'm going to do it. Okay, <coughs> so we've got uh, Rn equals uh, these two quantities. Uh, some of these should be pretty familiar, some of them are going to be new. So uh, for instance, T, that's the plate thickness. That, that's easy, just whatever the thickness is. If it's a flange thickness or a weld thickness or a web thickness, you got to look that up in, in the front matter of the manual. All right. D sub B, that's your bolt diameter. So that's just the uh, uh, bolt diameter for, for your given connection. And F sub U, that's the tensile stress. So that's easy. I'll tell you right now, the one that's going to give you the most headache is this one right here, this L sub C. Now L sub C is the clear distance between the material for the given bolts. Okay. Everybody okay with this so far? Let's talk about a little bit about this, uh, this equation, see if we can uh, simplify it out a little bit. Okay, <laughs> so remember, anytime you have a pile of junk that's less than or equal to another pile of junk, that's just the minimum of those two quantities. So another way of writing that is it's either the minimum of 1.2 LCTFU or, the, or uh, this one, 2.4 DTFU. Now, in terms of behavior, it's pretty simple. This, uh, this top expression right here, this is the one that's working to compute the, uh, the bolt tear out uh, ex uh, ca uh, capacity. The one on the bottom, or the one over here, or the one on the bottom, that's the one that's trying to predict how much the bolt hole 
is going to stretch or how much we're going to uh, plastification we're going to get right around that uh, that bolt. Remember how it sort of mashed up and turned into to play doh. That's that's what's going on right here. This one up top that's for uh, for tear out. So far so good. All right. Okay. Now let's talk about this uh, this LC a little bit. So I've got here a uh, just a single uh, plate. I've got two bolts in it. And I'm going to introduce some terminology for you. Now, one of these, uh, I say introduce, but you've seen this before. That's S, okay? So S is the longitudinal spacing uh, along the connection. Remember, if we were talking about transverse spacing, we'd call that G, right? Remember, because that's how we got our, uh, our stagger factors earlier. All right, so <clears throat> this is our center-to-center -center bolt spacing. And this right here is the edge distance, how far the center of that bolt is from the edge. So think, you know, that those are the dimensions that I would need if I was going to start drilling that plate, right? I'd measure that out and then that's where, where I would drill. Sound good? Okay. Now that's that's uh, just the general spacing uh, of the connection. LC is the clear distance from edge of plate to edge of plate, okay? So by its very nature, we're going to have two LC values that we need to compute, okay? We're going to have an LC for all the bolts that are on the edge, and then an LC for all of the, uh, the interior bolts, okay? So let's just take them one at a time. So if I was talking about an edge bolt, and I'll, I'll sort of clarify that here in a little bit. So if I'm talking about an edge bolt, here's L sub E. If I want this dimension right there, what do I do? I take L sub E, and I take off what? Half a hole diameter, right? Or a radius, if you will. So L sub C on the edge bolts is the edge distance minus half a hole diameter. So far so good? All right, now that's, that's for the edge bolts. For the interior bolts, so here's bolt spacing. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to take out half a diameter, another half a diameter, so I take off one whole one, right? So here's LCI, the uh, uh, clear distance for an interior bolt, spacing minus hole diameter. Sound good? Now. While I'm at it, let me just uh, go ahead and uh, draw another connection to just sort of clarify some things because I want you all to help me out with identifying this. All right, so let's say I've got a connection and I'm yanking on this, okay? So let's draw out some bolts. Let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. All right, so let's say I've got this. So our edge bolts are the ones that are essentially going to be located towards the back end of the plate. In other words, I'm talking about the ones that are all the way back here. The interior bolts I'm talking about are these, these, and these. Now, now I'm calling them interior bolts because look at it like this. Would you agree that you know, this distance, this line right here, that's the clear distance I'm after, right? That's the LCI. Well, that's going to be the same distance for this bolt as it is for this one, right? And for this one. And for this one, right? Assuming everything's evenly spaced, right? So real quick, let's just make sure we're clear on this. How many interior bolts does this connection have? Nine. And how many edge bolts? Three. OK. So everybody OK with that? All right, we're going to do an example here in a little bit, and that'll actually matter when we look at bolt bearing. Yes, sir. What about when you have a stagger connection? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is you just have to be a little clearer on your bookkeeping. So uh, I'll do a simple one just to kind of kind of explain. Uh, if I had a staggered connection and it was somewhat complicated, I'd probably just make sure I was taking each bolt one at a time and getting the right LC for each one. So for instance, if I've got this, and I've got, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, right? So let's say, so, so for these two on the bottom, my LC would sort of be that distance right there, and the same one for this one, so I'd sort of maybe treat those two bolts as the same. And then the center one, my LC is going to be whatever that distance is right there. And then these two up here, I'm going to have a, another one, and maybe something like that, and something like that. It doesn't become 
technically more challenging. It just becomes a bookkeeping issue. All right. Don't worry. I, I'm not going to do that on a celebration because if you can do a grid-like pattern, you can do this. It's, it's literally just a bookkeeping issue. All right. Everybody else okay with this? We good? Awesome. All right. <coughs> All right. So I want to make some observations about this bolt bearing. Remember this whole 0.6 thing I was telling you about? This bolt or this bolt tear out uh, calculation that we're doing, remember where we had the connection and we had you know sort of that shear failure right here and that shear failure right there? That is essentially a mini block shear check. I mean, think if I was trying to calculate the block shear capacity of that, now how would I do that? Well, I'd have the length and shear, right, LC, times the thickness, right, times some limiting stress times, it's in shear, so 0.6, right? So look what I got right here, 0.6, the length, the thickness, and a limiting stress FU. But there's two of them, right? There's a shear path over here and a shear path over there. So this 1.2, it's, I know, it's really just 2 times 0.6, and the 0.6 comes from the shear failure, right? <laughs> All right, everybody okay with this? So I really wanted you to see where this came from. This, this equation, this top one, it's not magic, okay? It's really just a block shear check on each individual bolt. Everybody okay? Now, I will be honest with you. The, the second one, this is a little bit of magic. This 2.4 DTFU, this, the, the mechanics associated with that ovalization, it's not easy, okay? It's, it's really not easy because you've got to understand plastic you know, stress distributions around a circular region. That math gets tough, okay? So this is what we do. We go down to the lab, and we like breaking things, right? You know, any day with controlled demolition is a good day. So we go, and we or go to the, you know, somewhere like Huntington Steel, and we order oh, a couple hundred different connections. We start varying you know, bolt diameter and thickness and steel grade, and we start failing all of them. And then we record the stress and we say, all right, can we match an equation that, that's simple and that works? And that's what you get down below. So that's an empirical relationship, okay? Again, it results from doing a lot of breaking things in the lab, but that's essentially the long and short of it. All right. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Now, here's where you're not going to like me very much. You're not going to be happy with me uh, on this one. So... Before we, uh, we're going to, uh, tomorrow, we'll, or not tomorrow, on Friday, we'll talk about bolt layout connections, but I got one final, I guess, parameter to run by you that you're not going to like. So when we calculated net area before, when we were looking at tension members, okay, we said, all right, the, uh, the, when we calculate a hole diameter, we take a bolt diameter and we add an eighth of an inch, right? Now, why did we add an eighth of an inch? Well. We didn't really add an eighth of an inch. We added a sixteenth twice. We did it for two different reasons. Now, we added one sixteenth because we actually physically drilled the hole larger, right? You've got a half-inch diameter bolt, and you want to install that in a structure. You have to drill the hole a little bit larger. And we, For standard holes, that's a sixteenth of an inch. But then we also added another sixteenth of an inch. And we said the reason for that was damaged material. But the expanded reason, expanding that out, is we were trying to ask the question, well, can we really count on that little bit of material right there around the bolt with all the burrs and the, you know, the damage from the drilling process and whatnot, can we really count on that to transmit load to the whole tension member? And we said, not really. Okay? So we added an eighth of an inch when we were doing that area for tension members. We're not talking about tension members right now, though. We're talking about actually assessing the capacity of the plate right there around that bolt hole, okay? So because of that, we are using the physical dimensions of the hole. We're not adding an eighth of an inch for this, we're adding a sixteenth, okay? I guarantee you, this is one of those details that is very easy to, uh, to, to uh, forget, okay? I know everybody's like, come on, really? Yes? No, 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 what we're trying, no, no. 
But what, what I'm at, now, going back to what I said earlier, what I'm after is I'm at, before I was asking, can I count on that material to effectively transfer load to the whole member? When I'm calculating bearing capacity, I'm not calculating the capacity of the whole member. I'm looking at each individual little plate one at a time. Okay? So I'm actually assessing the physical dimensions of the whole, you know, going out to the, to the fabricator and actually measuring it. Okay? In that instance, it's not an eighth of an inch, it's a sixteenth. Okay? Does, does that sort of help clarify that a little bit? I, I know it's one of those details, you're like, come on, really? This is more stuff i got to remember? Yes. It is what it is. All right. Um, one other thing I did want to do for you uh, is this right here. Um, remember what I did for block shear? I factored some stuff out. So you notice both of these have a thickness. Both of these have an ultimate tensile stress. And I've got sort of a common 1.2. So if I factor that out, I can calculate the bearing capacity of each individual bolt as 1.2 times the thickness times Fu times the minimum of either the clear distance or two bolt diameters. And it makes the math a lot easier down the line because, I mean, it, it'll go a lot quicker. If you had to calculate each one of those one at a time, it just becomes really laborious. And there's not really a lot of benefit to the calculations either. It's a lot easier. All right. Everybody good so far? All right. I think I'm going to uh, call it for today. What we're going to do next time is this. You know, we talked about bolt capacity and bearing capacity, but we actually didn't talk about some really simple stuff, things like laying out the connection. I mean, if, if, I, if I do a bolt, uh, bolted connection design and I say, okay, we need eight bolts for that connection, that's not enough. That's not enough to actually go out and fabricate it. I need to know how to space out those bolts. I need to know how far uh, they can be from the plate edge. So we need to talk next time about bolted connection layout. You know, spacing requirements, edge distance requirements, because there's issues with that. I mean, if bolts get too close together, you can't tighten them. You know, they start smacking into each other. So you have to have a certain minimum spacing. If they get too far apart, there's a potential you get water seeping in between the connection. And water and steel, they didn't go together very well, right? All right. So um, Next time we're going to go into that, and then we'll get into some, uh, some sort of full-blown design examples. I'll sort of skip ahead a little bit. I want to take a standard, like a typical bolted connection, and let's go through the math. You know, how much will it take to actually fail that connection? And then if we understand that, we can go into, okay, let's start sizing them. How many bolts do we need? How do we need to space them out and uh, uh, to, to safely uh, resist loads? All right. That's all I got. Uh, Sign-in sheet's working its way around. If it hasn't, if it hasn't already signed in, go ahead and do so. I also have uh, a few more homework assignments for a couple of you all that straggled in a little bit. Um, so that's all I got. Uh, for those of you in concrete, I'll see you in a few minutes. Everybody else, I'll see you on Friday.